welcoming back Susan Richard Shreve. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be back. Uh, I, I claim two years of Georgia residency, and it's the only state I ever lived in. I am a Washington, D.C., pretty much native, and uh, we belong to nobody, you might say. Um, this book, I never thought I'd write a memoir. I'm a novelist. I like to make it up. Um, I have a reputation for exaggeration, which didn't seem to go very well with telling the truth in a memoir. But I was sitting with a very good friend who actually was here not long ago, Howard Norman. Isn't that right? Was Howard Norman here with devotion? And I told him the story I'm going to read uh, to you today. And he said, that, that is the beginning of a memoir. And so I began to think about it. And the couple of things that really struck me was I was 11 when I came to Warm Springs, one when I had polio. So I really never knew anything different. Most people who had polio were struck down with a sense of themselves as young people because it, it was not largely a young people's disease, but it certainly was a young people's disease, I think, because of the way children play and it was, parents were terrified of it and schools. They were always in these little communities um, in which it seemed to be easier for the virus to pass around. But because I was a baby, um, I never knew what it was like not to have polio, but I did know what it was like to be an outsider in school. And so I was terrifically excited to be going to Warm Springs and th thought, you know, this is cool. I'm going to be one of the gang. I'm going to belong. And I went there only to find, and at the time I was uh, in braces on crutches, but that was nothing at Warm Springs. So I was once again an outsider. And then my mother, who I had been uh, very, very close to, uh, and my father went back to Washington. And that's really the way we lived. We lived without our parents there. I was 11 years old. All of those kinds of things that happen to young women at 11 were happening to me without supervision. And um, those of you who can remember 11, without supervision gives you a pretty free reign. I already didn't have a great reputation for obedience. And so Warm Springs was kind of um, where I grew up. And so I look back on it with a, a kind of interest and curiosity about who that little girl was who went there and um, made a big uh, sort of change in herself while I was there. And, and I think the combination of talking to Howard and, um, and then thinking about what it was like to be without your parents. And of course I was scared, but you would never as a child admit you were scared. So it was an interesting time. And um, in writing about it, however, something else happened. And I'd just like to say a couple things about it. There's a big biography out right now um, about FDR. Because so he made himself, for political reasons, so little of having had polio. Um, did the country want a crippled president? No, the answer was. And so there was this, what they called the splendid deception in which the country knew he was crippled, but he was never perceived that way. And he, he was seldom photographed in his wheelchair. He stood with a tremendous amount of effort with the aid of, of someone on either side of him. But he, he did not um, allow you to see him as in any way seriously impaired. And Warm Springs was his haven. What I did not know was that he bought it. He created what it was. 
It was, in fact, a holistic approach to medicine, which was his, that you treat the whole person and then the body. Um, therefore, the sense of, of being individuals in a social situation at Warm Springs was very strong. The sense of community was strong. And he also got involved in the architecture of it, uh, copying the University of Virginia's um, sort of the Jeffersonian quadrangle of the University of Virginia. It's very pretty. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's, um, and he got involved in the medicine. And so he was um, a, a real architect of something that for a small time in the history of this country was a huge and terrifying e epidemic. He also was responsible for starting with his law partner, the foundation, the March of Dimes, and um, raising the money outside the government, never would happen today, but raising the money um, that led to the eradication of polio and the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine. So it was a secret life, but it was a life that he treasured and um, it was the first major public health success that this country had had. So this was, this was a very um, exciting thing for me to learn about. Very different time, very hard for it to happen today with all the laws that we have. Uh, but nevertheless, for those of us who had polio and for all the children who came after it, who might have. It was a great gift to this country. I'm reading from the first chapter, which actually occurs in terms of linear time at the end of the book. Um, but it begins the book because it is, was the central experience of mine when I was at Warm Springs. It's Warm Springs, 1952. I was almost 13. On the morning Joey Buckley got his wheelchair back, got to leave his bed and move about the hospital grounds alone. I had been up at dawn before the Georgia sun turned the soft air yellow as butter. I lived in the eighth bed in a 16-bed ward of girls at the Warm Springs Polio Foundation and had been living there off and mostly on since I was 11 years old. That morning, at the beginning of April, I was wide awake with plans to slip out of the room without any of the 15 other girls knowing I was gone until they woke to the rancid smell of grits and eggs to see my empty bed carefully made. I was wearing blue jeans cut up the seams so they'd fit around my leg cast, a starchy white shirt with the collar up, a red bandana tied around my neck like Dale Evans my hair shoulder length and a side part, the June Allison bang swept up in a floppy red grogane bow, a cowgirl without the hat and horse, a look I cultivated, boy enough to be in any company. I wheeled past A.B. Kreider on the first bed, lying on her left side, her right leg hanging in traction above her hip, a kidney-shaped throw-up pan by her cheek, She'd come out of surgery the day before, screaming all night, but we were used to that in one another and could sleep through noises of pain and sadness or talk through them about movies and boyfriends and sex and God back and forth across the beds. Never pain and sadness. I shut the door. The girls' ward on the second floor of Second Medical was at one end of the long hall and the boys' ward was at the other. The long corridor with the nurses' station between the wards was empty at dawn, too early for the smell of breakfast, for the morning nursing staff to click up and down the corridors with trays of thermometers and medicines, even for the bedpans, which were my responsibility. I wanted to go straight to the boys' ward, where Joey Buckley might be waiting for me, but it was too early for that also. Too early for mail, which was my other job, or for orderlies to take the surgery patients down to the first floor pre-op waiting room, or for the domestic staff to begin mopping the linoleum for a new day. Too early for anything but the baby's ward, 
where I went every afternoon to take the babies in my lap for, for a wheelchair spin around the walkways, pretending they were mine for keeps, these orphan babies whose parents were off in their own houses in other towns, like my parents, 300 long miles away in Washington. These babies couldn't do without me. But this morning, days away from 13, a girl of high temperament and little patience, I was burning with anticipation. I wanted to go as fast as a girl could go, a winged runner with hair on fire, hanging over the side of an open cockpit, a high wind blowing my clothes off. I passed Miss Riley, the red-haired head nurse, her long freckled legs stretched straight out from the chair where she was sleeping, her head thrown back against the wall, her mouth hanging open. My wheelchair was standard issue, made of wood with yellowed wicker on the seat and back, and it was squeaky, so I pushed it softly by Miss Riley's office down the corridor to the elevator, hoping not to get caught before I carried out my plan. When the elevator doors opened onto the first floor, Dr. Eiler was rushing out of the baby's ward, and I waved, but he looked right at me without registering who I was or wondering, as he ought to have, what I was doing up and dressed at dawn. Running away? That's what he would have thought if he'd seen me through his own preoccupations. On bad days, running away was what we talked about doing, as if we had legs for running or anywhere to go, stuck in the Georgia countryside, prisoners of our own limitations. Susie Richards, Dr. Eiler said, suddenly stopping and turning around, as if my presence had come to him in memory after he had seen me in person. What are you doing up at the crack of dawn? I couldn't sleep, I said. Well, be careful, he said, and I thought to say of what out here in the middle of mainly nowhere with doctors and nurses and priests and orderlies, no danger here except the invisible one of my own secret desires. But what did I know then about fear of what was inside myself? I'll be careful, I said, and he was gone. Outside the front door, the air was New England chilly, fresh with the beginning of spring, and I wheeled my chair through the big door, down the ramp onto the sidewalk, thinking of Joey Buckley's brown eyes, deep and dark as winter ponds. The buildings of the Warm Springs Polio Foundation had a kind of fading beauty. It had been a late 19th century spa, rebuilt after Roosevelt purchased the old Meriwether Inn, and grounds with low white buildings and wings around a grassy courtyard, with walkways, some covered like porticos. I thought of myself as living in a hotel. I was grown up and beautiful and walking without the aid of crutches or braces, walking in high heels, and I had come to this hotel on a holiday to find the man of my dreams. I wheeled over to the wing where the boys' ward was located, stopping just below it so Joey Buckley, if he happened to be looking out the window beside his bed, would see me there. Behind me, the door to the main building opened and shut, and I kept my back to whoever was coming out, hoping to pass unobserved. But the invader of my private romance was Father James, another recipient of my unguarded affection. And he had seen me. I could feel him headed in my direction. Mary, he said, coming up behind me, out of breath. He called me Mary, because I had told him my middle name was Mary, and I was called by that name at home, although my middle name was really Lynn. But neither Susan nor Lind seemed right for a Quaker girl converting to Catholicism, as I had been in the process of doing with Father James, wishing to fill the long, empty hours with something commensurate with my desire, and because I loved him and believed he would like me better with a name like Mary. Much of my free time at Warm Springs was spent figuring out the best way to be liked by people. I wanted to like me. Not everyone. Only the ones who judged me bad for reasons I could never understand, neither the reasons nor the meaning of bad, and the ones I adored since I was at an, at an age and had an inclination to love without reservation. What are you doing up so early, Father James said, giving my wheelchair a gentle push. 
I couldn't sleep, I said. What about you? He hesitated, and I could tell, even before he spoke, that he was inventing some excuse for being in the hospital when he normally would be getting ready to serve at the 6 a.m. mass, generally attended by the staff at Warm Springs, either on their way to work or on their way home. Did something happen to one of the babies, I asked. I saw Dr. Eiler. Dr. Eiler was in the baby's ward, he said. Were you there for a sick baby? And I suddenly remembered our recent conversation in catechism class about last rites. I had been fascinated and repelled about the idea of a priest, a man in a stiff white collar and black robe, but still a man, ridding the dying of leftover sins, so that fresh as a daisy, as my mother would say, the dead could pass into heaven. I loved the Roman Catholic Church with the body and blood of Jesus popped into our mouths and incense burning and bells and chanting in Latin, but passing into heaven held no appeal for me at all. Were you in the baby's ward doing last rites? I asked, my mind running through the cribs of babies. Eliza, Jane, Little Maria, Tommy Boy, Rosie, Susu, Violet Blue, Johnny Go-Go, all those babies of mine with the nicknames I had given them. Don't go into the baby's ward today, Mary, he said. Can you tell me which baby, I asked. He tousled my hair. Not just now, he said, and I watched him walk away in his long black cassock, his muddy shoes showing below the skirt, his long thinning hair flying above his head in threads. Halfway across the courtyard, he turned and with his cassock blowing behind him, walked back toward me. Mary, he said, kneeling so we were face to face. I know you're thinking you'll go to the baby's ward as soon as I'm out of sight, but you can't. This was not a patient you knew. Instinctively, I didn't believe him. I watched until he was out of sight, and then I crossed the courtyard on a diagonal toward the movie theater. Not an actual movie theater, but a large room where current Hollywood films were shown to the patients mostly children, either sitting in wheelchairs or lying on stretchers and body casts, everyone in the hospital who could breathe without an iron lung in rows of white sheets. The next afternoon, a Saturday, I would be going with Joey Buckley to see High Noon. That was the description of my Saturday. I would tell my parents during our Sunday telephone call, always just afternoon, a ritual of longing and dread. I went to see High Noon with Joey Buckley, I'd say. We do everything together lately. I knew it would please them to hear that I had a best and steady friend, a Joey Buckley whom they'd met but didn't know, filling the gap their absence had left. It would please them to think of me doing the things that normal children in the sixth grade did, like going to the movies. It wasn't necessarily true about Joey Buckley. I'd usually be in line with all the girls from the girls' ward in wheelchairs, and we'd follow the stretchers moved by push boys, and behind would be the line of wheelchairs from the boys' ward, and then the grown-ups who had the freedom to move, if they could move, out of the lineup. When I saw Joey, he would be in a line of wheelchairs behind me, several boys away. I saved stories for my parents to make them happy to soften their sadness over not being with me, which I knew they wished they could be, which I wanted to believe they wished they could be. And the stories had some truth, along with the addition of a happy ending. I added the happy ending, perhaps by nature, perhaps in my own defense. A child can cover a multitude of sadness simply by inventing happiness, can escape the kind of sympathy that smothers her spirit and save her fledgling self in its slow and lonely process of definition. All week, I'd think of the conversation I'd have with my parents the following Sunday after church, collecting imagined victories, social engagements, popularity, good behavior, although I had not told them I was going to Mass every Sunday or how little I missed the long silence of Quaker meeting. Only that noon was the best time for them to call.
had in mind to draw the picture of a busy 12-year-old girl living an ordinary life in a hospital at which children got better and better and never died. I would tell them of crushes and best friends and compliments from doctors on my progress and athleticism from nurses on my good citizenship and work on behalf of others. I was, in short, deliriously happy at Warm Springs, as they desperately hoped I would be, and grateful for the opportunity to get better for free, costing my parents almost nothing as a result of President Roosevelt's March of Dimes. Money collected in a highly successful campaign held every year on the anniversary of the president's birth <laughs> which supported, among other things, the treatment of children at Warm Springs. Stopped in my wheelchair in a corner of the courtyard, thinking of the dead baby, some dead baby, passing sinless into heaven, substantial or insubstantial. I just didn't think it was possible or desirable, and the thought of it, dying and going to heaven, was unacceptable. I wanted to call my mother, my darling mother, and tell her a baby died today in the baby's ward and hear her soft, magical voice pressed to the receiver, saying my name. But of course, I would never tell my parents that a baby had died. It would frighten them so far away from me, so vulnerable to my fate. My plan for the day, <clears throat> after Joey Buckley got his wheelchair, was to go with him to the candy shop where we got to go sometimes twice a week, always on Fridays, and this was a Friday. We'd get cheese crunchies and grape at and sit in the sun behind the buildings where no one would expect to see two patients sunning. I'd buy him bubble gum with baseball cards as a present for getting over surgery, and we'd talk. I was an excellent listener. And when we'd finished our snacks and I had hold of little pieces of Joey Buckley's life, we'd race our wheelchairs down the steep paved hill where on Saturday afternoon the stretchers and wheelchairs wound their way down the path between the buildings from the courtyard to the movie theater. I wheeled across the courtyard to the top of the paved hill and looked down. I was good with a wheelchair. I could push the chair up to a high speed, take hold of the right wheel with a strong grip and make an 180 degree spin so that my body, like a keeling racing sailboat, was nearly parallel to the sidewalk. I could wheel up that hill without stopping, without slipping backward, my hands like little vices on the wheels, the bone showing through the skin. I wanted to move as fast as the chair would go, crouch my body down low so my head was just over my knees, stretched out in front of me. I stopped at the top of the hill on level ground just before the bend. But if I were to move inches into the downgrade, the chair would be off on its wild ride to the bottom of the hill, and I'd be holding on for dear life. That's how I saw myself. And imagining the speed, imagining Joey Buckley flying beside me, our hands on the wheels ready to stop on a dime, I decided we'd do just that. We'd race down the hill this morning early before too many people were sitting around the courtyard on such a fine day. First, before doing anything else, we'd race to the bottom and secure our friendship like surviving warriors. We'd make it to the bottom and fall into each other's arms. I had arrived at Warm Springs in the late summer of 1950 on the same day that Joey Buckley arrived in his leather and aluminum chair, both legs crippled in long leg braces, a motherless boy from a small town in Alabama. I was alert to his presence, greeting every new face as a possibility, and I liked the way he looked with his square face and wide set brown eyes. In the waiting room, as we checked into the hospital, his father sat next to my mother, and I remember the image of him exactly. Olive skin, broad face, and long, shiny hair. His head held in his big hands, as if it had cut loose from his body. Joey would have been an athlete. He would have been a great athlete, this boy, his father told my parents. He would have played football at Alabama, and now what? Now I'm going to be fixed, Papa, Joey said. You too? He asked me. 
It was still early morning, breakfast trays collected in the wards, meds distributed, plans in place for the rest of the day. Joey and I were parked at the top of the steep hill looking down. It's a long way to the bottom, he said. I was checking Joey's cast sticking out in front of him, propped on pillows, blood seeping through the plaster at the top of both of the casts. The blood's from my stabilization incision, he said, conscious that I was looking at it. You bled too, didn't you? Right, I said, a shadow of doubt, a cloud floating across my sun. But I had only one stabilization and you had two. So that's a lot of blood. It'll dry up, he said. So why are we doing this? For fun, I said, just for fun, don't you think? Yes, for fun, he said. He was smiling and his eyes lit up and I knew we were ready to push off. Hand in hand, I called to him. I can't push if we're holding hands, he said. And lined up side by side, we gave a huge push on the metal ring on the wheels of our chairs, and we were off down the hill faster and faster, and I think I was squealing with excitement, and so was Joey. And maybe he called out, how do we stop? But maybe he didn't. We were going so fast, so much faster than I even imagined in my dreams of this adventure. I felt that I was losing control the bottom of the hill rising to meet us as we sailed down side by side. And I grabbed the right wheel to stop the momentum, grabbed it with all my might so the chair would turn 180 degrees and stop there at the bottom. And as I did, sensing that the chair would stop, that I had taken control in the nick of time, I saw Joey fly into the air just ahead, out of his wheelchair. The chair tipped on its side, and Joey gliding above me, his arms flailing, his heavy white casts, pulling him down, down, down to the cement walk, and then the heavy thud of the casts hitting the ground, or the thud of his head, and silence. Thank you. I have an Another little story to tell you. Um, as you all know, we were all children. Uh, you feel responsible for everything you touch, in a way, when you're a child. And um, I think that sick children have a tendency to feel particularly responsible because it's very clear that lives are circling around you, that everybody's life, that you're the center of attention. But it's not a lot of fun. You're not a lot of fun as a center of attention. And in my own life, I had a little brother um, who, who certainly didn't get my mother's time. Um, my father's career was changed as a result of my having polio. So I was, I was pretty conscious of um, having been uh, a, a burden. And... Therefore, the sense after this accident uh, that I was fully responsible for what had happened was the sense that I had. Um, it, it was, it, it, it led to a great many things and it led to a veil of silence with my parents um, that I never asked them what had happened to Joey Buckley that they never mentioned it. And in fact, like a lot of polios, I walked out of Warm Springs and did not look back until I was 65 years old. So it, 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 it was clearly something that had been a big deal in my life, this accident. And when I was sitting down to talking to Howard Norman, I was saying, as you, we do with friends, um, I was telling this story, and I realized that I had never told it before, except when I was 18 years old, I wrote a novel. And I wrote a novel which was very helpful in this book because I can't say that your memory is too exact after 55 years. So I wrote a novel, and in it there were many factual things. Terrible novel. It was never published. Um, but there were many things that, that were 
very helpful in bringing memories back. And then as I got close to the end and it was summer and I was reading it outside and I found myself getting more and more nervous as I got close to the end because I knew what had happened. I knew that I had incited to riot this little boy and that we had gone down the hill in these wheelchairs and that he'd been hurt. But in the novel, I was the one who was hurt and he'd come out scot-free. And it was such an interesting revelation to me about what you do, how you tell yourself stories, and how I changed the story so it worked out. So I was guilt-free, damaged but guilt-free, and the little boy was fine. I did not expect the little boy was fine. I went through the records, and in fact, this was an interesting thing. I saw an awful lot of the records uh, that, that are, belong now to Georgia State, the, the patient records. Uh, not the records, but the names. And um, and I simply um, didn't imagine that he was alive. And nor did I see a name. His name was not Joey Buckley. It was like Joey, but I couldn't remember his name. And in fact, there was only one person out of that whole experience of living two years in this hospital um, that I ever saw again. I was, about a month ago, I was um, driving to meet a friend for dinner. And I should, I should preface this by saying that when I went to see Warm Springs, and I hadn't been back, um, I was shown around by this lovely woman who is, who's um, sort of in the development office, because they don't know what they're going to be now, what with Medicaid and... and uh, the fact that there is no polio, they don't really, nobody can stay long term in a hospital. They can only stay for a month, and a, a month for a paraplegic is not going to help. So that's that they're trying to figure out what to do with this quite beautiful facility, a lot of state of the art, art equipment. Anyway, I was, she was showing me around, and it was sort of exciting because a lot of it looked the same. The ward where I lived, the place where I lived in a double room with the one person I've kept up with. And um, I just, it, it, there are things that were so familiar to me, but the hill wasn't there. And I asked her, where was the hill? There was this great hill. And uh, we figured out a building had been built on it. And that was it. Anyway, so I was driving to meet a friend for dinner about a month ago. And um, I got a telephone call. And the person said, were you in a guy? Were you in Warm Springs in 1952? And I said, yes. I pulled over to the side of the road already. I thought, I'm retracting this book. It's not going to come out. Um, he said, did you go down a hill with a little boy? And I said that I had. He said, I am that boy. And I got on the next plane to Nashville and went down and uh, met this 68-year-old man um, with whom I raced down a hill. And it was sort of the serendipity of this of this book because, of course, he got in a heck of a lot of trouble for racing down the hill. I got in more trouble, but I'm a girl. That happens to girls. But he got in plenty of trouble. And it just, it was a very, it has been a very sweet, uh, I was on the talk, of, the talk of the Nation yesterday, and he called in. It, it's been a, a very sweet story. But what this particular part of the book and why this story was so important to me um, it is that sense that you have of responsibility um, for other people and responsibility for yourself. And I, I realized that it was something that had been uh, really troubling all my life. So the fact that I, the fact that he wasn't dead at the end of that was, was great, great news. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and it's very nice to have come back and reacquainted myself with the state of Georgia. I feel as though Georgia gave me a whole 
second life, and I, I certainly attribute it to Warm Springs and living two years in this very beautiful state. So anybody have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes. It's an NPR station. I don't know. I don't know where it goes. I know that I got calls in yesterday from all over the country. Here, mm -hmm. he f he found me because he went to Warm Springs for the first time. He had been back, and he said, "Listen, I'm not interested in this place, but I want to find a hill." And he was shown around by the same woman. So. It was one of, it was just, he read the book after that. I mean, he hadn't read the book before. He, he, he got in touch with me. She gave him my number. He got in touch with me because of that. Yes. Thank you. It was a very strange experience. I must admit, <clears throat> the novel that I wrote was very helpful. And I looked at pictures because they looked like ancient history. To look at pictures of 1952 at things like cars really looks like, was I alive then? Um, but I did this book in a way I've never done a book. I went to a library. I stayed there for usually eight to 10 hours. I never more, write more than three hours a day. And I simply read books about that period, read about Roosevelt, and I wrote it in a rush. And I think that I, that I made that leap because I, because I didn't come out of it. We had sold our house. We were living in somebody else's house. Sometimes I was living on my daughter's couch. And so the library became my home. And it really was an interesting experience of reminiscence of being able to pull a time back. Because it felt like that time to me, too. I mean, I did feel that I was in it. And it felt like that girl, um, which I didn't know that I could do. But it was, it was a really interesting experience. I can assure you it's my first and last memoir. I don't have a thing to say about my life after 13. <laughs> yes. I've been, I've been very lucky. A lot of people have gotten what's called post-polio, which they are assuming as a result of, and he has it. He walked for a while, not easily. Um, and now he has crutches and he has a scooter. Um, he's a record producer. And, and so he hauled around the world for a while. But um, I think probably the reason why I didn't get post-polio is because I was, they feel that post-polio comes, and it does. You, you just get out, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, that it comes because you've overused the muscles that are left, and they just wear out. I, I had no standard to reach because I didn't know what it was like to walk. So that I, I think I didn't wear out my muscles as quickly because I wasn't, trying to be what I'd been. That's just, a, I, I, I didn't, I was asked to be a st part of a study and I'm very suggestible and I knew if I were part of a study on post polio, I'd get it. So I, I, so I decided that I wouldn't do that. Yes. We're the same age. <laughs>
You know, they have asked me. They are having a reunion. A lot of people at Warm Springs, and these would have been people who were older, met the person that they married. Um, many settled in Warm Springs, and I don't know if you've been there now, you'll see a lot of houses that have um, ramps, you know, that are wheelchair accessible. I, I am going to go if, if they have this reunion at Warm Springs, but no, I wouldn't have otherwise had I not written this book. And I can't even explain why. I can't explain why we didn't keep these friendships because they were friendships. And at the same time, I, people have often said, I've, I fill up my house, I fill up my house with people. And people have often said, you know, how can you stand it? When my children left, I had my children's friends move in if they were going to be in Washington. And, and I realized that, that those two years that I was obviously deeply missing my parents, and the 16 of us in this room, we lived in a kind of isolation among, in a group. But at the same time, there was some sort of protective feeling about being a part of a group. And then we dispersed, and we were never in touch. It, it, I, I, well, I can't quite answer that, but no. But I did go to my 50th high school reunion. Yes. Were you there? It was a wonderful hill. Well, I think the the boys did it, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They've got a building there. Mm -hmm. Is it, is the hill there? We couldn't find it. Well, I want, then I probably was looking in the wrong place because she couldn't find it either. That is there. I think that I had a sense that it was straight down. Maybe it was... Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty steep hill going down to the west end of the town. That's it. I've been studying this, that um, the boys are better engineers than the people. They turn the wheels this way and that way. This is what I learned after the fact from my friend, Joey Buckley. <laughs> Many times. Did, did you both go?
That's what I was told. I saw some of uh, some of those. It looks great. I thought it looked awfully. Mm-hmm. It's going to bring people back. Well, well I think it's, uh, it's kind of a, a thank you for the people who, who participated in the columns. Well, she called, this same woman who told me, called me about coming this week. I think it was not until, I mean, it sounds like you guys kept in touch with people. I was. I, I was having surgery, and you know that surgery. Did you have surgery? The surgeries are nothing. Today you'd be in and out of the hospital in a day. But. Exactly. I'm 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 68. <laughs> but I'm also 28. I was trying to think how old am I? Maybe I am 28. 